Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by GhostBed.com. Welcome to Drinking Bros, kids. As you see, we got a full house today. I have half a house, uh, which makes me want to go do ayahuasca uh, in the jungles of Peru with a shaman. Therefore, we're here with a company that actually does that uh, with veterans. What's the name of your company? Uh, Heroic Hearts Project. Yeah, and you guys are doing God's work. We're doing our best. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't believe in it, by the way, um, you've seen it on like numerous specials and things like that. Logan uh, from Black Rifle Coffee, who you obviously know. Dan, why did you sit him next to me? I, you he asked. looks better than me on camera. This is terrible, dude. Yeah. Why do I have to sit next to Brad Pitt with a, with a beard? And a shitty nose. I don't know. <laughs> you asked me, and I was like, yes, I would love to sit next to you. You've got a great nose. It's it been so face. long since I've been in your presence now. It has. Especially since you're in Texas, and I don't know why we haven't done things together in a close proximity. It doesn't you make any sense. You are gone a lot uh, with Black Rifle yeah. Coffee. I see you and Evan doing epic shit all over the world. Yeah, you just and, did some uh, snowmobile trip last week, right? Yeah. Yeah. How was that? It was pretty freaking epic um there's also psychedelics involved in that trip was it really <laughs> oh yeah um if you've ever ridden uh snowmobile at 80 miles an hour on uh psilocybin it's a wonderful experience you get your face very wind burnt but um it makes the trip a lot better but we went up to this crazy hot spring that's like in the middle of nowhere you had to take <laughs> snowmobiles like what 40 miles to get there and then it's just like this natural hot spring that all the miners used to go to back in the day okay no i'm gonna no clarify power. for the audience miners you're talking about hats not girls under 18 right correct okay good thank just you. for the thank audience you. thank you yeah i don't want to get you me too where it's just like oh hey we're we're all <laughs> it's my buddy logan he's like chris D'Elia. we're it's all a going resort into for the miners? woods yeah no, that's why does that exist it's Why called it? summer camp <laughs> motherfucker <Yeah. laughs> the hell you guys talking about <laughs> no but i get i get sights um about what you were doing because dan was originally supposed to go and yeah i think he was i yeah, think Logan, we were looking still a spot yeah, yeah well we were, I, I didn't I well just, you were i couldn't go, go too. so like fuck man I, I couldn't go well i was gonna go also but i couldn't go for that one it's like fuck i knew that you would like it right? i did i knew yeah. that you would get a lot out of it <laughs> like most I, I knew some people that would enjoy it but probably wouldn't get as much out of it but i figured you would get more out of it than most people so it was a, it was an easy decision yeah and I, you know kind of walk me through this um who you guys are and why you guys started to do this because i think it's awesome right there's still a lot of people who are just like well you're just taking people out in the woods and getting fucked up on drugs which is not the case no absolutely not and that's sort of the the misconception we're trying to trade it's not just you know people use psychedelics they can do it recreationally they can do it to have fun but what we're we're really going for is using these in more of a therapeutic sort of fashion so like what dan was saying like logan could really benefit from it and uh i can kind of explain a little bit more in terms of why that works but really what we're finding and what research and universities like johns hopkins are finding is that psychedelics are very effective for treating depression ptsd all sorts of different issues even potentially head trauma and so you know obviously if you say psychedelics everybody has a like hippie 1970 sort of thing in their mind uh so we're trying to change the narrative like hey these can be very beneficial we've seen a lot of vets you know that have tried all sorts of different therapies go through the va and this is the first thing that gave them a breakthrough and so yeah i founded this uh back in 2017 after my own experience i was a, I was a ranger mm -hmm. and just kind of struggling and nothing was working and the va was was pretty unimpressive and uh found my way to amazon i was like holy shit, this is not what i thought psychedelics was um and so zach actually joined uh the project pretty recently um so you can yeah, Zach, Zach, why did you get involved? Are you a veteran as well? Yeah, yeah I was a Marine Raider. And, uh, uh, come a step up to the yeah, mic. Zach. I was a Marine Don't Raider. Don't be afraid and, of it. Uh, there it is. <laughs> you got a good voice. Yeah, yeah. get after, into the mic. Uh, after leaving the military, just kind of struggled a little bit. Um, life kind of started tumbling downhill. Uh, realized later it was PTSD. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in my uh, recovery, trying to deal with that, went through the standard VA options of here's your 30 pills you got to take every day. Uh, things just weren't going right. And, and, and uh, what are those exactly? What are, what, what are the first pills that they give you to say, hey, man, these will be great. You're on your way. Yeah, it starts with the SSRIs. 
which uh, then kind of gets you stuck and then other stuff starts to not work. And so they add other things on top and on top until it just gets to a point where yeah. you're, you're just non-functional. Yeah, like, I know you don't like Xanax, but have you, have you tried it with Selexa? <laughs> have you tried yeah. two Xanax? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's worse than standardization. So, that shit. Um, really was just kind of stuck, you know, if, if they're, they're supposed to be the experts and this isn't helping, it's actually making me worse to the point where I'm suicidal, then what else is there? Mm -hmm. um, and I was lucky that, you know, I, I got on social media, I saw a friend, a, a guy that was also a, a former Raider, and he was, he was happy, he was, he was smiling, and this wasn't your normal smiley kind of guy. So I called him up, I'm like, yo, dude, like, what's your, what's your secret? And he was like, plant medicine, man. And so <laughs> yeah. I just kind of started my journey. And luckily, I ran into Jesse a few months after that. And uh, we, since then, it's been nine day difference. Yeah. Um, and, and I kind of want to talk about uh, your experience, Logan, because you, uh, Dan and I were, were working um, and you were kind enough to give your spot up mm -hmm. to Logan to go do it. But no lie for weeks and weeks and weeks on the shows, you were talking about going to, to Peru and yeah, how yeah. excited you were and everything else. Yeah. What was it like for you and what did you learn and how did it change you? It's a big question, but um, the initial reason why I wanted to do it very similar to him was I, I just wanted to like, I, I never went down the prescription pill route. Like I was just like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to participate in that. And so it was, it was constantly this um, pursuit of trying to find alternative medicines in order to like improve yourself. Right. Um, you know, similarly, I think a lot of veterans in general and a lot of people that we went on the trip with are like obviously dealing with a lot of shit based off of what they experienced in combat. Mm -hmm. That's just the, that's the way it is. That's what vets are dealing with now. And so more than anything, like I, I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was in a horrible place when, when I went down there. I, I felt pretty good about everything. Um, but it was more like I just wanted to open it up myself to do this exact thing, to talk about this experience, to open it up alternative therapies for other veterans or other people who have gone or experienced trauma in their life to be like, yo, listen, you don't have to go to big pharma in order to like figure out what's going on with you. There's plenty mm -hmm. of other options, whether it be ayahuasca in the jungle mm -hmm. or mushrooms or, or peyote or mescaline. Like there's so many other things that you can do based off of things that come from the ground and some of why these things are still regulated as heavily as they are from the government doesn't make any sense. Well, no, it, does make, it does make sense, but it's because the government can't get fucking lobbying money from the well, industry yeah. that's farming that shit. That's and they why. can't tax it. Well, yeah, yeah. from a, they're, they're from a concept of why it is the way it is. Yeah, it makes sense. But like it, it doesn't make any fucking sense no, it certainly for, doesn't. for the well-being of our species <laughs> and how we should be going about business. Well, what so. does it say about uh, what does it say about the American, uh, what does it say about America at large, but the American healthcare uh, situation that people coming back from the longest war in our history have to go to the fucking jungle to find <laughs> relief? Yeah. yeah, it's embarrassing to be honest. Because yeah. it almost seems like you're going back, like a, yeah. like Apocalypse Now. Where exactly. Like, That's I was like, you need to go watch Apocalypse Now after this, <laughs> listening yeah. to this podcast, like kind of wrap your head around. But like, yeah, it's it's immediately right. You're like you need to detach from everything in order mm -hmm. to like get back into your your human self. But, uh, you know, they was like, we did a lot of, a lot of prep work, Jesse, uh, prior to going down there, it was like, we, you know, we were very strict with our diet and making sure that there wasn't like a lot of grease foods. And then we wanted to limit the amount of proteins we were taking in and they let like really lead you up to it. Like, okay, set your intentions for what you're going to be doing and what you want to get out of that trip. And then like, don't really have any expectations. For, for what you're going to be experiencing, right? Like we've all listened to Rogan talk about DMT and, mm -hmm. and, and some of the other people that have had these experiences. And, you know, you talk to people who like smoke it and have these 15 minute type of things go through. Um, and so that was, that was when I was just like, I was open, I was free. I was just like, let's just do this thing and let's see what happens. And okay. So, so let's, let's start with the food though. Yeah. Um, why is that key to watch what you're eating beforehand? So, I, I've heard there's diarrhea, um, there's, there's, uh, you get sick, you throw up a lot. Is that why? If you're doing both, it's called the double platinum. <laughs> uh, so at the same time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've had that in Mexico on spring break, uh, the double platinum. <laughs> Um, but why is that important to not have grease in your diet and all that stuff? So, I mean, Logan brings up a good point. And, and, you know, the psychedelic itself can be very beneficial and it can be, you know, just help you through that. But it's not a magic pill. And so the more preparation, the more you kind of get into it and you know what you're doing, you have the support network. It just it changes. It, like it makes it a much more effective sort of aspect. It's a whole treatment platform protocol and, and mind frame. So in terms of like the diet, it's really just having sort of a clean diet just because you are ayahuasca comes in like a 
sort of a, a drink, a very thick sort of brew. It uh, doesn't taste that great. And so when you, when you drink it, it's going to be absorbed by your like stomach and all that kind of stuff. And so like if you're eating all this kind of shit and you're, you know, smoking too much pot and all this, other, you're not going to get the same effects that you would if you're having like a clean diet because it's going to hit your system. It's going to be much more effective um, and possibly easier physically, too. So we see people that have eaten like a shit ton of meat beforehand or, or greasy foods, and they're probably going to have a lot more like uncomfortability. No matter what, the majority of people do puke through the process. Mm-hmm. Um, this, Why is that? It's just, uh, I mean... Because it's poison. Yeah. It's right? a, it's a I mean, that's, it's a toxin. So. There it is. Yeah. Well, that was that so fucking hard? Yeah. yeah. So it is, it is a, it's a... Of course it is. Okay. But, it, but not in the sense that it is like... Not in the sense of other toxins. Like, you're not going to overdose. And like, if you leave right. it in and you don't puke, it's not going to like tear apart your your mm. esophagus or anything there's like no that. real danger but your body sure. does, yeah. your body yeah. doesn't want it inside yeah. of it yeah. okay yeah, the, yeah, the puke and the purge it's also a it's, a it's a reset it's kind of a hard reset on your system and that's yeah. just your body's way of like okay pff, we've gotten rid of that let's start fresh yeah it, it's a way of matching up like what's happening to you physically and what's happening to you mentally because typically in the experience you get to this point where you want to like you start off with a lot of times this, this visual journey and then it evolves into like a lesson and then you're like dealing with something mentally as you're going through. And then that like puking is like a, a means of like releasing that both mm-hmm. metaphorically as an emotional state or a mental state and then physically like getting this. Shit so you're saying body. the process is important. Like maybe we shouldn't ban things that are offensive, for example, correct. Or <laughs> try there. There's a, there's a really good statement. I don't remember who, who coined it. Um, but it's in the coddling of the American mind, and it says, uh, prepare your children for the road. Don't prepare the road for your children. I think it's really profound in this sense yeah, because we're, sense. Talk, we're talking about preparing human beings for life and then, you know, in your situations, preparing them for the rest of their life and then, or until the next date on their hedonic calendar or whatever. But, but, yeah, I mean, I think it's – there's something about the struggle. You talk about coffee and grapes, Right. They, they want to struggle on the vine because it makes them sweeter. It, it, it helps them develop into what they're supposed to be. And we've come to this point in life where we expect there to be no struggle. Yeah. And we rebel at the idea of it. And then we, we call it offensive if somebody says we, that we're stupid for rebelling at the idea of the struggle that has defined our entire existence. It doesn't make any fucking well, sense Well, yeah, dude, literally anything that makes people uncomfortable anymore, they want to fucking cancel it. And this is fucking ludicrous. Like, I, this goddamn Dr. Seuss shit is blowing my fucking mind right now because i'm looking at I, w- I went through and i looked at all the imagery on this i'm like what well, like this does not merit removing dr seuss from the history yeah books, i mean man. Do, does it so if a guy is painting with an airbrush painter down in venice and he makes your head too big it's like oh he thinks white people's heads are too big <laughs> yeah. I mean, like it's a character like, get rid of street artists yeah, I mean, well, like the, the grammys hell? are coming up next month the song of the year that is up is, is, is wet ass pussy yeah by cardi b yeah. and it's like she will <laughs> graphically tell you in detail how she wants you to, to choke her while putting your dick in the back of her throat. Um, but Dr. Seuss is pretty fucked up for kids, I guess. Right, so yeah. yeah, it's bad. Um, <laughs> but let's let's go through this process because I'm I'm unbelievably curious about it. I've always wanted to do it. I've told my wife this. Uh, you get on a plane and go down to Peru. Uh, Peru. We, we have a few different locations. So part of what we do as an organization, because it is Wild West in some, in some respects, you know, the, these, like ayahuasca, for instance, is endemic to the Amazonian sort of cultures. And so there's a lot of different uh, tribes or a lot of different traditions. And now that it's becoming more popular, there's obviously an economic incentive for people to do all sorts of different offerings. Not all are equal under the sun, especially when there's less you know, regulation. So what we try to do is go to these different spots, find good, safe um, places that align with us and that are also comfortable working with veterans because that's another big thing. Um, and so a lot of them are in Peru. That's where a lot of the, the popular traditions are, are coming from right now. But we've worked with spots in Costa Rica. We're looking into Mexico, Colombia, you know, all these places. They're all fairly similar, but they're, they're slightly unique. But they can all be very effective as long as, you know, you do that whole preparation protocol. But, for instance, with Logan and, and also uh, Zach, uh, one of the ones we really like to use because it is back on this, like, it, it tends to be a much more intense ceremony mm-hmm. and there is benefit in that, that struggle. Um, and so that one was in Peru in like a small town, fly to Lima, take a small plane to this, this town called Terrapodo, just 
typical small town, and then most of these places are isolated. So this one was kind of up in a mountain. A lot of them are right by the Amazon jungle, like deep in the jungle. Um, but it, it's it's been catering to Westerners, so you can go like hold your bag above your head and go deep into the jungle. But a lot yeah. of these places are kind of like rustic retreats where you know you're not having AC, but you do have a comfy bed and you're you're separated from the elements somewhat. And what's the average number of people you're with on these trips? Um, some of the bigger retreats will have like 20 or so, but those will be strangers. Like with the veterans, we try to keep it around 10 to 15 just because it is such a strong, poignant trauma. And you are doing this hallucinogenic substance that can last for up to four hours and can be very intense and really take you like super into it. So in terms of the control safety and making sure everybody's like balanced there, having that, you know, like around that, that number is, is generally a pretty good mix. And Logan, when you got there, um, were you nervous when you walked in? Because, you know, you've seen it, you heard about it, we all have. You don't really know what to expect. Uh, the, my experience was uh, uh, just trying to find any footage on this was fucking Chelsea Handler on Netflix, right? So she went down and did it, and she's crying, talking about her dead sister yeah. and all these other things. And I'm like, oh, shit, like, this is pretty intense. Knowing that, you know, I don't know what's going to come up in my life. Uh, everybody's been through some sort of trauma, one would imagine, in their life. What was your experience going in where you're like, oh, shit, what is this going to do to me? Yeah, I was trying not to have any expectations from the from the get-go. I was like, just just be open. I wasn't nervous at all. I was like, I, I think I had a really good feeling because, like, Jesse reaching out to Drinking Bros, Dan throwing this on my play, I was like, I kind of just felt like it was supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. I felt like it was the thing that I was supposed to do. It was like the next part of my, you know, chapter in my life, so to speak. Um, and so going into it, they, they, you know, the, like the preparatory work that goes into it is like it, you get there and you like, there's, there's nothing to be tense about. There's nothing to be like overtly stressed about because everything is very comfortable They're They set you up properly. So going into it, there's not really anything to be nervous about in my opinion, because you're going down there to do this thing. So like, right. why, why necessarily, you know, you're not in danger nothing overtly negative is going to happen outside of you may shit yourself. <laughs> um, but uh, other than that, there, you don't have to be too, too worried about anything. Well, mine is the mental aspect. So to be honest with you, like the, you know, I was, I was kidding at the top about the puking and the shitting thing. Mine is the mental aspect of what it might do to me and would it change who I am? Right. Yeah. Uh, because you, you're worried about, I, and I talked to Dakota about this one time, um, Dakota Meyer about emptying out the hard drive, so to speak, where you're just like, I, that there's there's too much data in here. I need to unload it. Well, what happens when it does leave your head? Then are you left with your own thoughts or new questions and things like that? That's what I'm nervous about me personally. Well, I mean, yeah. you just don't have any kind of that. Your your, your absence, uh, uh, an outlook on philosophy in your life. Then, if that's the case, but you know what I mean. Like you, you if if you think that way, it doesn't matter the the details that fill your head. The structure is still the same. You're still the same human being, right? You're, 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 it, it, I hate the word biohacking, but you're, you're speeding up a process should, that should take a very long time to happen essentially. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And moving those bad things out of the way. I mean, look, if you're reacting a certain way right now and that's part of your character based on bad shit in your head, then that shouldn't be in your life in the first place. Right. It's not. So like the things that have happened over like the last, I don't know, let's just take six months to eight months. Right. Um, I, and this is, I'm totally genuine when I say this, like there is shit with like when they shut off the stock markets and mm. the election and things like that, where I'm like, or the, the books, what you were talking about, Dr. Seuss, right? Yeah. What I do for a living is free speech and everything like that. It slowly feels like all of this is being ripped away. We don't have any answer. Like the stock market thing. We don't have, we had a guy on like fucking last week. We don't have any answers about why people were just able to stop a stock market. Right. The election. I still have questions about it, but I don't think I'll ever know the answers to that, right? Um, there's deeper shit in my life that I've come up against re more recently in the last six to eight months and having children and then deciding what to tell them what I think is right and wrong or what I actually believe in without sounding like I'm wearing a fucking tinfoil hat. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It does feel like all this stuff is constantly getting stacked on top of each other and it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And you're like, oh, fuck, well, where are we going to be in fucking five years from now? Yeah, like, it seems like it's going to be really fucking bad. And you're like, OK, it's a great question. Let's back that up. Mm -hmm. What can I do? The only thing you can actually fucking control is yourself. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what this trip was like. All right. If 
if I can at least control myself, know where I'm in, control my mental state, like all of this stuff is, you can deal with it, but you can't deal with it if you're not already good up here. Mm. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, and it doesn't, it never changes. And that's a big question about psychedelics. Like, there's a lot of misconceptions. One, there's, you're not going to be addicted to it. It's like anything else. You can get habitually, like, dependent, but you're not, there's not an addictive property to it. And two, it's not going to make you, you know, I, I grew up with, like, the, the urban legends of, like, if you take acid three times, you're considered clinically insane. Or, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I had yeah, a friend yeah, of yeah, a friend that yeah. turned into a glass of orange juice and they were afraid of being tipped over. All that kind of stuff is, is bullshit, you know? And like, yeah. it won't change. I've never seen anybody change. It changes them fundamentally, but it does unburden them or it does help them process. And what you see with a lot of people, especially vets, is you get caught in these sort of negative patterns and it's so difficult even through talk therapy to get out of those negative patterns. And then that reflects like you, when you get stuck into that, you have outbursts against your kids or you get stuck in that same, you know, the friend that always has that same bad relationship. They always choose the wrong girl, wrong guy, yeah, yeah, stuff yeah. like that. So it's having that reflection and also getting past those traumas that end up down the line actually causing this sort of negative repeated behavior so it sort of unburdens you but you still have to take the ball that you like if you see that accurate reflection you still have to do shit with it you know you can't just like oh i'm still gonna do the same exact thing and expect different results yeah and i, and I hope i'm not outing you or anything but like i remember when you got back we had a meeting over at black rifle and uh dan and i were talking about the trip previously and they said you had gone on it and somebody at the office over there was like yeah man logan seems like a different fucking person man he's just He's just a happier guy every single day. Now, I don't know what you were going through before, um, but what, did, what about that experience changed you to become that, if that is true? No, it, it was 100% true. And I, I think it's just like a lot of times humans in general, they, they just get into this grind, right? To where like you, you kind of forget about what it means to exist as a human and, and what it means to be a part of this amazing experience of being on fucking earth. Like we're literally on a spinning circle rock. That's just being flown across space. Like every day, like it's pretty incredible when you think about it that way. And it should be life should be awesome. Like you were saying before, like everybody fucking stresses too much. Like, yeah. You're, yeah, you're absolutely right. Like people need to calm the fuck down. People need to calm the fuck down. And when bad shit happens, we should be like, yeah, all right, fuck it. We'll deal with it. And that's all that there really is to it. And you come back, at least for me, I came back and I was like, man, I just felt so relaxed and at peace with like the universe in general. And I think I've heard so many people say this and my experience was absolutely this way. You're like, man, everything is connected. Like the, like we all have the, like this aura about us, this like balance between everything and it's all connected like this this larger collective conscious extends past humans and it gets into the living creatures in the locations like everything has this energy and you feel one with all of this stuff and you're like yeah you feel like the universe is like working with you and, and you're a part of this and that really makes you feel positive about being and existing on the planet yeah there's no presumption so the, there's something in uh in in debate and uh, I, I forget the phrase for it, but the, the idea is that you give your debate uh, opponent the benefit of the doubt. You don't assume they're saying it's something grace, but I can't remember what it's called. You, you don't assume that they're acting against you. They're just speaking their opinion and maybe they are, their content, context makes it make sense for them. But for you, it doesn't make sense. And that's why you have to have the goddamn conversation. But anyways, right. people think, people get these ideas that, everything's against them and it, it's easy these days to feel Hell that yeah, way. it is uh, because the government and big business in this country are <laughs> yeah 100 percent uh and so are the other cunts that are hangers on for them so but i never thought that and then in the last six to eight months i right. I, I have right but, yeah. the, but so the way you're feeling now about just your role as a as a human being and a professional and a parent in, in america that's how a lot of people feel down to the very core of their being and it's not about specific influencers it's about they think the universe is against them because it feels that way right? correct yeah and yeah. this is what he's talking about yeah that's so, the shit he's getting rid of and and let's describe your trip so to speak right yeah. after you take the ayahuasca and everything um did it bring up memories of the past uh things you had seen in the military um the future what was it exactly for you personally yeah it was a lot of the messaging was extremely metaphorical and the way that my brain spit out these lessons is it's, it's still entertaining and humorous to me now um but so it takes about 
30 minutes to 45 minutes for it to like kick in. And for me, I had very strong hallucinations. This whole, the whole thing was like this visual journey for me to where I was like, I, I wanted to do that. I was like, so looking forward to the next one. Cause it was such an amazing visual d display. I mean, it starts slowly. Like real, it, real stuff or, or things that aren't there. Um, things that aren't there. Okay. Like your, your eyes close the whole time and <clears throat> you're, there's there's stuff to keep you grounded. The shaman is is doing some like frawn leaf stuff pretty much the entire time to like just make sure you know you're still human and, and you're not getting lost in this hallucination that you're on. But within the the first thing that happened to me was this like building of geometric shapes and colors. So it was like, you know, imagine a diamond that turned into a rhombus uh, that you know, shifted and scoped and then it starts moving and then it becomes this broad display of colors. And then it, that in those shapes start layering mm -hmm. and it becomes this like moving four dimensional visual experience. And then you, I started pushing through that to where it felt like I was surfing the universe. It was like the, that first initial thing was literally one of the most amazing visual experiences I've ever had in my whole life. And then what happened? Where do you go from there? I, Hard stopped and I was sitting in a tree in the jungle, <laughs> like beautiful purples and greens. And I'm just, I'm just sitting there and like, just kind of taking it in. It feels loud. So like you're, you're in the middle of the jungle in this hut and you, you hear all these jungle sounds and, but in the, in the vision, you don't know what is in here and what's actually mm -hmm. hitting your ears. And then all of a sudden this bird creature pops down in front of me. And it's got the, the plague mask. Sure. But it's bird like limbs and stuff. And it like my first initial thought was like, this should be the most terrifying thing that like, I felt like I should be scared, uh -huh. but I wasn't at yeah. all. And then it like picked up its like little bird arm. And then it like started cutting me open from like my throat down now we're chest. talking now we're starting to party a little bit yeah. <laughs> and i'm like oh my god like it felt warm and wet almost mm -hmm. but there was no pain there was no fear associated with any of this and i was just like looking at this bird with this plague mask on like uh, i'm just riding this wave and then it, it kind of reaches out of my purview and it holds up this like glowing white gem right and it takes it and it puts it in my chest there it is full and, iron man and then it Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah, then, yeah. like, all these, like, little tiny hands come up and, and stitch me up. And that was 15 minutes into the journey. And, man, I, that, that one, like, coming right out of the gate with this is um, one of those things where, like, I'm, I'm so glad that that lesson came right away because it's exactly this. Like, I interpreted that as, like, yo, you got to be vocal about this shit. Like, you got to go out and you got to talk about this stuff. Like, you have the platforms, you have the connections, you have the ability to do this. Like, this is something that needs to get out into the world in some way, shape, or form. So it was, like, real life, real world implementation, like that first thing that I got. Okay. And then did you see or go through any experiences that happened to you in the past? No. Nope. Not, not a single one. There was like no reliving, um, bad memories or anything like that. It was all like very, very cerebral stuff. Okay. And, and I'll give you this example. It was like, there was so much of me surfing the galaxy. Like that's most of what my visuals represented. And it was very like, it was all lessons. Like it was, I was, I wasn't like reviewing stuff that had happened. It, it was all like, let, like here's your playbook moving forward in life, gotcha. which was super cool. And like the biggest one for me, which is a huge takeaway and just an interesting visual to think of is like, I, by the, th we did four ceremonies by the third one. Um, I had gotten, um, what, I, what I'd call a guide, I guess. Yeah. And his name was Abraham and he <laughs> was, uh, he was about like this big. And so not six foot four, no weird beard, no, no for any slaves, slaves. Yeah. no attachment to anything, uh, religious or biblical whatsoever. He looked like a care bear mm. and, ah. and he would just kind of chill on my shoulder and kind of guide me through. What was things. the symbol on his tummy? It was, it was, uh, free of symbols. Mm. So, ah, yeah. Wow. Well, that's America. I say days. care bear because that's the, 
like the <laughs> most likely thing that I can think of because like what, how else can you just dis- Teddy describe Ruxpin. this fucking Teddy bear? Sure, sure. Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's yeah. a lot of Teddies. Yeah. Um, so I, I, as you're you're doing this and you finish right uh, yeah. towards the end of it, do you wake up the next day and do it again? Like how many times do you end up doing ayahuasca? We did four. Four, four and eight so. days or four and seven days. Four and, like four and like a week. And yeah. that's yeah. that's pretty typical for, for those three to four over the course of the week because it, 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 if we, a lot of the vets that we deal with, it's like they're very good at compartmentalizing and they're very good at suppressing mm-hmm. all this trauma. And so it makes sense that, you know, it can be sort of this layers that unfold. Mm-hmm. The, first, the first ceremony, people are just trying to get their like sea legs, so to speak, of like, the fuck am I doing? Like, what is this? But then through that process, people get really, really deep and they're able to sort of hash out specific spots of trauma, get past that. Come, then there comes re- resolution. Oftentimes in the middle, it can be super difficult. Then towards the end, they're like, oh, I understand like what I'm, why I'm having all this issues. And this is sort of the path for like what Logan said. So your next three trips, were they similar? Uh, no, no. The, the first one was like very like, here's here's everything like we're, we're showing you what this can be um the it's se- interesting you say we're showing you what what do you why'd you say that um because it felt like i was getting like i was getting lessons from like multiple different um sources so, so to speak so if there i mean let's let's forget about any any kind of uh supernatural thing if that is the case and it particularly if that's how you conceptualize it uh, that kind of plays into the idea that there might be some kind of uh, 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 stem cell, but in your brain, right? Like yeah. a social stem cell almost. Like we know how we're supposed to feel and act and things like that. Sometimes it needs to be unlocked because we can't figure it out yeah. in our lives. Yeah, this, it, this shit's so cerebral to talk about. And, mm. you know, sometimes a lot of people are like, oh, you're just fucking talking out of your ass. But it feels like if I had to put it into human words, it's like this thing can open up your brain to operate on a different frequency. And it feels like you're touching into like the, you're operating on like the fourth dimension mm-hmm. or a different dimension where you're able to, your brain's able to function and receive messaging and visuals that you wouldn't normally be able to do. Like, it feels like I would love for somebody, and I'm sure this may have happened just a minute, but like get hooked up to an EG or a EKG, EKG. Yeah. EKG and like see what brain waves are coming out of this as, as they're going through this, because it feels different. It feels like you're existing on a whole different plane. It was literally one of the things I wrote in my notebook. I'm like, I'm in the fucking fourth dimension right now. Yeah. And that, that's a lot of people's uh, descriptions yeah. when well, they do it. A lot, a lot of these uh, uh, psychotropic drugs uh, can slow down the frontal lobe, right? Mm-hmm. The, all, the, all the visual stimuli and audio stimuli we're, we're getting right now is gone. So your brain is allowed to do what it's supposed to be doing in the first place, right? Like all this is a distraction. You tune that out, you're still seeing it, but it doesn't occur to you anymore. So you're, right. you know, your things like the olfactory gland and the hippocampus, which are so closely related, uh, start to activate and talk to parts of your brain that are, that are better for cognition, right? So you're starting to make these connections that you never would have been able to make before. It's just like, it's like you're sitting at a railroad and the tracks are going one way and you just pull the fucking lever back and they go the other way. It's, that's, a, that's a simple, probably reductive analogy, but... And that's, that's exactly what the brain scans and what the current hypotheses are of not only does it, can it work on that psychological sort of level of people moving past trauma, but also that there does seem to be actual physical effects on the brain in terms of increasing these connections between neurons, increasing different connections of different parts of, brain, of the brain, um, actually creating new neurons yeah. and sort of resetting, uh, again, what I was saying, those those negative patterns that we get stuck in it almost like an etch a sketch like shakes that up so that way you can afterwards um create those new positive patterns and those new connections and because that's how the brain works it's like by reinforcement Mm. the more neurons make that connection the stronger that bond is and so those can be very hard to break if it is some like a bad habit or something along those lines and this does seem to help out with that that process now do you talk to the shaman beforehand and say hey Here's what I hope to get out of this experience. Is there any way to guide me or is it just once you're on it, you're on your own journey and, and there's nothing that can really be done? Or they, do they try to talk you through certain instances? Um, and, and I guess to put it in, in, a, in an example, like if you go to a psychic, right? 
they'll ask you, all right, well, who do you want to talk to? What are you hoping to know about? What do you want to yeah. accomplish there, right? Well, that's because they're, co- they're doing cold reading on you because they need, that, they need yeah. you to talk about your information so they can pick up on it and then make assumptions. Sure, but, um, but they also don't want to talk to you for fucking four hours no. you know, unless you're Dion Warwick. Especially if you're, not, if you're puking and shitting your pants the whole time. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Is, is that what... <laughs> so, I mean, like, it, it depends on where you go. But the, generally speaking, like, the, the shaman or the facilitator, the, the, the person leading it will at least talk to you and see where you're coming from and seeing what you're, look, like, what you're struggling with and all that kind of stuff just to kind of get the read on you. Um, but the way, like, especially in the Peruvian tradition, sort of the belief system is that what they're doing there with the help of the ayahuasca is managing energies and all that kind of stuff. So at some level on the, in their viewpoint and what they're doing when they're at the helm, it doesn't matter what your specific toxic, whatever you're giving up, it doesn't matter what the name is of it. It's more of them helping you go past that. And so like in the Peruvian tradition, they have these songs called uh, Icaros, which is they learn it through their own, like, uh, working with the medicine and they learn the songs actually from the plants in their in their tradition mm-hmm. And so when they sing these different songs, it actually does have a oddly different effect And this is one of those things that's very hard to explain to somebody that it's like oh, they're just singing it but It's almost like a deep tissue massage where like sometimes we'll just sing the song and it seems like It's just you just want it to stop because you're like, oh, I don't want to go there That's super uncomfortable. It's super uncomfortable But it's like getting out that like nod or getting out in their belief system that 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 energy stuck uh, and then there's other ones where you feel like you're almost like lost and you're you're freaking out and then this like song comes and it's the most comforting warm guiding light that you can possibly have and so that's their whole like process of doing it there and so and if somebody's having a really hard time they can go over and kind of give you more specific attention and and all that kind of stuff but it's not like in the psychic of like hey you're talking to Abraham Lincoln or or what have you it's kind of more of like helping you guiding you through the process, through what they're doing. Yeah, and, the, and again, one of the reasons I ask is um, for veterans in particular, right? If you had some PTSD in war or a certain moment that happened to you over there that is so traumatic, you think about it every single day. Do you go in and talk to the shaman and say, hey, here's what happened, and I, I can't live my life without thinking about this one moment every single fucking day. Can you help me with that and try to clear my mind of that moment you can. I mean, it'll, it'll generally come about anyway, mm. whether or not you like say that. Um, <clears throat> and that's so like with Logan and, and Zach has his own experience as well. That's one of the reasons we we think it works so well is because like if you go to a therapist, it's almost it might be tailored to you, but it's kind of one size fits all. Like right. here, mm-hmm. here's your talk therapy. Logan, what happened to you then? Say it again. What happened to you again? Yeah. And then here's your one prescription that is supposed to like cure all of your stuff. This is everybody's experience is different. So some people need kind of more of the metaphorical or they're looking for that interpretation. Um, other people might have to go back and sort of relive. So there's been a few veterans that, you know, they'll, they'll actually see a particularly traumatic event in their life, but they'll see it from multiple different angles from the person that maybe they shot or from their own perspective, or mm. maybe even from like a helicopter or from like the moon zoomed out or something like that. Other people, you know, uh, have more, metaphorical but are sort of related to that everybody has different interpretations like you know some people need religion some people need kind of more of the connection to nature and so this is working with you on your level in a way that you understand on a deep level uh and it's that's why we think or that's why i like ayahuasca in comparison to a lot of other psychedelics because it seems to be particularly poignant Mm -hmm. to where when you go in you if you are trying to deal with something you almost can't avoid it. It's like, here yeah. this is, you're going to be in this for the next four hours, which can seem like an eternity, and you're going to deal with this shit. Like, you're not going anywhere. Yeah, ayahuasca is the power plant, and things like psilocybin are just relay stations is a, okay. good, is a good way There's to also, hurt it. Yeah. We're really good at misidentifying what causes our trauma, so what actually led to it. So oh. we focus on the big, shiny thing. Oh, man, it must have been this big, shiny thing chances are that's not necessarily what it was right. you know something happened 20 years before yeah. that that predisposed you to this this outcome and so having having a sort of relationship with the shaman and explaining to them what your problems are mm-hmm. and, and having them work with your energy uh, in ceremonies is, is it's just really amazing um and then my my experience my first experience the the shaman knew my background so uh, alcoholism drug addict trauma sexual trauma military stuff 
and just was there with me the entire time and knew I was struggling to go through some of these things, you mm -hmm. know, the little, little fixer visions I was having were all over my body, but also I was having trouble breathing, crying, kind of screaming a little bit. And he made the point, he said, you know, it's okay to say this is enough. It's like, do you want to stop? Do you want to take a breath and just come out of it? Um, and in my mind, I'm like, nah, man, I'm here to dance. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, let's yeah, do this. Yeah. But it was him giving me permission to say, it's, it's all right to just thank your opponent and say, hey, this is a good fight. We've had a good match. Like, clock out, come back in, we'll do some more tomorrow. And giving that permission, like, that was, that was really um, freeing, I think. You know, we don't have to win this all. We're doing good work. We're moving forward. Um, that was really helpful. And I, I don't think, you know, I've been through tons of therapy before that. There was never anything like that. It was just... It, so I don't know, pure and, and old. Well, there's like no that. one, there's no way for one human being, one human mind to treat 30 or 40 or 50 other human minds. That is not how life fucking works. Nobody is coming to help you unless you're helping yourself. It's really that goddamn simple. And it's something that we, for some reason, have decided to forget. We didn't, we didn't forget it. We decided intentionally to forget that shit. The same way we, we, we decided that the institutions like police, and fucking and masculinity that protect us from danger are all of a sudden offensive now. We're morons yeah. as human beings. But the point of that is no one's coming to fucking save you ever. No one's coming to save you and your family. If it's an emergency or if it's just life day to day, no one's going to save you. You got to fucking do it yourself. Right? Yeah. You got to take you have to take ownership of your shit and but make something happen. Sometimes when you're going through hard stuff, uh, it's hard to know that you are, you know? Uh, the outside world can see it but you might not be able to see it on the inside initially. Um, programs like this would really help of like, hey man, I'm feeling a certain way about X, but a lot of people don't have anyone to share it with or talk to about or, or some place to go and do it. What were you personally struggling with going into this trip that you were hoping to clear up in your life? Um, <clears throat> there was a lot of uh, like self-doubt and self-deprecation. Um, like little, little personal stuff here, but like I was always, um, I always felt like, um, you know, stemming back to, to some childhood stuff and then some things that had come about in my life as a, as a part of, um, my service is like, I always constantly make everything worse than it needs to be. It's called uh, catastrophizing, by yeah. the way. <laughs> I, I'm like, I'm conflict oriented. I need to fight through fucking mm. everything. I need like, I, I'm never fucking good enough. I'm always doing something wrong. And so like, it was like working through that and like coming to this appreciation of like yourself. Mm -hmm. essentially to where it's like, Oh, you, like you, you don't have to be this way. Like one of the things like I, I wrote down in my fucking notebook was like the negative voices have been purged. Like you don't have to deal with that stuff. Or if it does come about and like, we, we all have that, right? Like we all have that mental voice that comes through and it's like innately negative mm -hmm. and it always fucking nipping at you and you fucking hate it. It's like, no, my, my brain just said rework it, like turn it into a lesson, like yeah. figure, figure out a way to like make it work for you, make it beneficial so that you can use that thing that you are now perceiving as a negative and turn it into a positive. And that's really what it was, was like all these like little different lessons that happened over the course of these three ceremonies or four ceremonies. And, and then very similar to, to Zach, I had a, my, my last one was like the, my second, third ones were like really tough. Like it, it was a very heavy couple ceremonies uh and then that fourth one was like i figured out that like i could control the trip and that was like kind of the the all-encompassing wrap-up for that for me it was like this thing that like showcased all of this awareness mm. and, and all of this like mind expansion things was telling me like hey you you get to craft this thing like it's your spaceship like drive it drive right. it however the fuck you want it's cool. right, right, right. You know, where you want to go where you want to go it's funny we we're talking about egyptian shit yeah. earlier like mm. My, one of my last visions was like seeing this like huge like body of water that almost looked like a human laying down like underneath the pyramids mm -hmm. and I saw like all the different chambers and channels in the periods I'm like I don't you know I don't know what that means but it's really fucking cool yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah what what you describe by the way of uh, always blowing things out of proportion psychi psychiatrists call that catastrophizing and it's mm. one of the number one things the most common treatment for post traumatic stress other than pharmaceuticals and the U.S. is cognitive behavioral therapy, right? CBT. A lot of us have done that. Um, one of the first things they try to un undo out of your brain is that idea of catastrophizing. Like, every th anything that happens is the worst thing that could ever happen. 
And that's just not true. Yeah. As a matter of fact, most of the things that we consider big problems are minor inconveniences. Mm -hmm. And then you, you, you see that throughout a normal life. Now, when it's compounded by things by like post-traumatic stress and things like that, you, this is where you get the guy flying off the handle for no reason at his kids. You know what I mean? Or whatever the fuck. Yeah. The stupid shit that we see a lot of us do, some of us have done ourselves, just yelling at people for no reason and doing dumb shit, being reckless. It's all a result of that. And being able to move that shit out of the way, what you just described in a week is about two and a half to three years yep. of cognitive behavioral therapy. That's what I said when I, when I went, I was like, that, that was 10 years of therapy packed right. into one week. For, and it's like not that. about, like you keep asking about the individual issue. It's not even about that, right? It's about having a healthy mind. You know what I mean? Is that why you wanted to do it? Uh, yeah, yeah, for okay. sure. Yeah. And it's not it's not an either or too. Like we want people to be in talk therapy. Right. Like it's just a it's just a force multiplier right there. You know, like yeah. if, they, if the person's it's already it's a fucking Moab. Yeah, yeah if somebody's <laughs> already like. Um, you know, mindful and they, they can kind of like discuss this mm. stuff. With, they're just going to hit the ground running when they go to this. This is just like, you know, therapy on steroids where you're at the wheel, you can fight your own demons and it makes sense mm. in a way that there's no way for somebody else to, to, to explain to you. It's almost like connecting your conscious subconscious, uh, going through all these feelings, getting it out of your system. And for a, a pretty common thing that a, a lot of people do. And I think CBT kind of touches on this mm. where you want to sort of zoom out from your own life. So you're not getting consumed by the anger. You're not getting consumed right. by the anxiety and psychedelics have this interesting thing where it almost perspective. Yeah. You mm -hmm. see, your I don't life. know what, I don't know how to really, it's like, third. I've, I've never been able to really describe that, but it just gives you perspective. Like I remember the first time I did acid, I was 11 years old. But we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll yeah. get into that later. Yeah. Uh, uh, the first time I did acid, the very first thing that I realized is that everybody around me was full of shit. I'm like, you guys are fucking lying. I could tell it. I didn't know why I could tell it. Then I realized, oh, shit, I'm lying about shit, too. They could probably tell that I'm lying. Fuck. Yeah. It was like a real weird thing, and I don't know how to really describe what it felt like. It felt empowering at first, and then like I was naked afterwards. You know what I mean? But those are things in reality that you have to deal with. It, you, you can't just... I don't, I don't know. I, the, the perspective part of it was the most important thing to me. Like, you're talking about looking at it, looking at your situation from different perspectives or whatever stuff. I really... I have experienced that quite a bit and it is very helpful to understand. Like that's, that's the root of empathy, right? Yeah. Like we can all be fucking cavemen and beat each other to death and there won't be anything left. But unless we care about our families to, enough to protect them and build civilizations to make them better and then, you know, make the whole world better and stuff like that, we're all going to fucking fail at some point. This is not a zero sum game here. It's, it's, or I'm sorry, this is a zero sum game. Either we survive together, or we're all going to fucking be done. You know what I mean? Anytime any kind of existential threat comes. If a meteor is heading towards Earth right now, Ben Affleck and Bruce Willis are not going to be able to stop that bitch. I think Ben could. Don't count them out. No. If Ben was on coke and in, in alcohol like he's supposed to be. If he just punched up into the sky. Yeah, I mean, I've yeah. got a fucking shot of him over there. If, it, if that's the Ben right there, he could do it. No, like, I'm, no I'm fine with it. Yes. No. Sad, well, yeah. sad Ben is that? Sad Ben Affleck <laughs> smoking, doing coke, and then fucking a 24-year-old uh, playmate is the one that's going to save the world. This new fucking sober guy isn't going to do shit. Not doing shit. Yeah, no, he's not going to do anything. He's yeah. Batman. Well, he's not the, <laughs> yeah. the best Batman, but he's a Batman, mm. sure. Um, but it know. seems like what what you're saying, Dan, like uh, with the way that society is today, mm. right? Like, would you guys agree that it feels like everything is like constantly being amplified? Like everything, like yeah. the, our conflict that is yes. being about as our current situation. The stuff's getting stacked on top of each other. Yeah. That we're, we're becoming more and more conflict oriented. Yeah. And like, man, I'm not gonna fucking lie. Like, there's been a lot of vet suicides like popping up. Like, I, I man, I get I'm investigating the third third brigade, 82nd Airborne. It has uh, 50 in the last 10 months. Dude, just the one brigade. I get fucking phone calls and I'm talking to dudes. I haven't counted them. They're like fucking this guy and this guy and this guy. I'm yeah. like, Fuck, dude. Like, what? What do we gotta do? Like, to put awareness out or just like what is going on? Like, I feel like we're the biggest problem that we're facing right now as a culture is like not really being talked about and not, well, you know, like the, the, trying to fix the, it. The DOD is not required to report those numbers to Congress anymore. You're, you're aware of that, right? Well, I mean, you like, it just doesn't make yeah. any sense. Like 
the VA's own numbers, four out of the five last years, suicide mm. rates just increased. And this yeah. is like since since 2016, it's been and, four out of five. And yeah. what they get like 80 billion in, in funding every year, and you know, there's a lot of awareness, but they're yeah. not. And I know psychedelics, that word is taboo, and people are like, oh, I don't want veterans on drugs that like right. our drugs. But we're just offering more tools. It's not for everybody. We're not trying right. to get people on psychedelics. But there is clearly a lack of tools. And yeah. we've seen, and that's why I also wanted like Zach here. It's like all of these guys are like veterans, normal veterans. Mm. They there weren't like, you know, tripping mus mushrooms while they're in yeah, service yeah, yeah, yeah. and all like most people that come to our program come somewhat begrudgingly because they mm. are out of options. Right. And we're just providing more tools that fortunately do seem to be exceptionally um uh, effective mm. for for treating the stuff that people will hit their head against a wall for, for right. 10 years now there's there's this isn't all just about for me at least it's not all about just treatment i know that's what you guys do but i know for you personally this is more about growth personally and professionally now we have stephen kotler who wrote stealing fire coming on the show in two weeks what would you ask him if he was here right now because i'm curious what you would have to say to him because um, i know you've read the fucking book so Stealing Fire? Yeah. I don't know that I have. Oh, maybe you didn't read that one. We all read it like in 2017 sometime, I think. Oh, no, I don't think. That's not ringing a bell. Mm. For so he, Thanks he, for putting me on the fucking spot. Yeah, where'd you go, Dan? Logan can't read. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he just called him out. We're going to send this clip to Steven. We're going to play it on the show because he's a fan of Black Rifle, too. So Yeah, yeah. Good well, the beauty of it is, is then, you know, you can send Logan... Back to uh, an ayahuasca journey where you can <laughs> to talk about his trauma, fucking yeah. illiteracy. I'm people making fun of me no, for so, not being able to read for too long. So I mean, Stealing Fire was written by the same dudes who wrote The Rise of Superman, right? So Stephen Collar and his okay. partner. And it's, it's about unlocking human potential. They talk mostly about group flow and ecstasy and how Dev Group, Delta, all these guys have been using mushrooms for years to do shit like this. Um, and then in the professional world as well, when uh, uh, Sergey Brin and whoever the fuck is Paul was Larry Craig is his partner, or is that the other guy? Larry mm -hmm. Craig's the guy they hired. They took Larry Craig to Burning Man for his interview for oh, six okay. days. Yeah, right. Yeah. So there's a lot of it wasn't it was about stripping down all the pretense, you know what I mean, and seeing what this motherfucker's made out of. That's the whole point. And it's imagine being able to do that to yourself in a situation where it's safe and you can be truly honest with like what who am I exactly? Yeah, you know what I mean. That, that's what makes this process so interesting to me. Yeah, and, and for somebody like me, like the, the interest of doing it is exactly what you said. Of like, shit just seems to keep building and it keeps getting heavier and heavier and heavier. Before I had kids, I, I don't give a fuck. Like all of it's hilarious and, and whatever, man. Yeah. Uh, having kids now and then, then you're gonna send them out into this world and you're like, what the fuck is this world? With politics being amplified, me too being amplified, fucking cancel this, cancel all of this shit, right? It seems to just keep getting bigger and bigger, and it almost feels like you're, as a parent, worried about your child's little tiny mistakes that they might come back in 20 years, and that's been a discussion from publicists. Um, there was a movie I just watched where they were, uh, Billie Eilish, it was a Billie Eilish doc of all things, and they were questioning one of the lyrics in her songs, and one of the record labels says, hey, I don't think you should put that in there about uh, not doing drugs and how, I guess she's sober or whatever, but she was 16 years old, and, uh, and she was like, what do you mean? And we're like, well, in 20 years, what if you do drugs? Somebody's going to come back and get you for this, this one fucking line and a song. And I was like, Jesus Christ, man, that's a heavy thing to put on a 16-year-old, right? This, the other thing that I was watching today was, uh, I, I don't know if you have seen these Tom Cruise videos on TikTok. Um, the deep, the deep fakes, deep they're fakes. really good. They're so good that it scares the shit out of you that let's say it happened to you. Or you. Uh, and, and it just was Logan saying the N-word about Black Rifle Coffee, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. it is so good yeah. that by the time it actually caught up to you, right? Mm. Because shit goes this fast. Yeah. It goes viral this fast. It would ruin yourself as a person, your fucking company, all your friends, everything else for something that wasn't true. And then you got to spend the rest of your life backtracking. And let's say people don't see that interview or read that fucking article and they don't know. And that's the only thing they think about Logan. That's what fucking keeps me up yeah. at night personally. Yeah. Um, so for me, that's why I would want to do this is like, I just want to empty out the fucking hard drive. Yeah, it, yeah and absolutely. That, and that's just a, a direct byproduct of the current social structure that we find ourselves in with the communication capabilities that exist mm. within humans today. And yes, exactly right. Like you go down there and you're like, oh man, this stuff's really easily navigable. 
Like you, you, it doesn't feel like you don't get the heaviness of existing in society after coming back from it. Like you just feel like one with the whole, the whole system. Right. And, I mean, and even the way it is right now, you're like, ah, oh, maybe yeah. it's just, this is, maybe we're just as a species, we're just kind of teenagers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we're just working through puberty and we're fucking it all up. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Cause we were out when you came back at something and you know what, we obviously know your girlfriend and all that stuff. And, uh, I remember her yelling at you. She was like, I don't understand why you don't get mad about anything. Nothing upsets you. And you were like, man, they really, life isn't that big. Like these things are small that you want me to get upset about and everything else. And it was after you came back and I don't know if it just changed you that much or whatever, but I remember well, laughing to myself and I was like, yeah, that whatever she was saying really wasn't that important. You know, we take all these, these rocks in life, these, these different things, our bills or, or worried about our kids or lyrics or whatever, and just throw them on our pack and get more and more and more pressure down. And the medicine just provides you opportunity to drop that pack and just kind of reset. So one of my, like one of my recurring visions is just people chilling around a fire, it's just families, community, grandma, caveman's like knitting caveman clothes and everybody's <laughs> just, everybody's just happy. And I'm like, man, like, wow, that's so simple and easy. And that's what life's supposed to be. Like, we're supposed to be happy. And then I walk away from that. And I try and take those lessons to my real life. And when I open a bill, I'm like, oh, shit, I can't pay this. Like, you know, I can <laughs> still got to pay, but I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to carry it the same way that I did before because that's, that's not my life. That's not who I am. That's right. just that's just. Yeah. And it's a benefit beyond the stress. I mean, it's about improving your life ultimately. And who makes good decisions in a time pinch under heavy stress? Not many people are very good at that. You know what I mean? Most people make dumb emotional decisions when they're stressed out. Like, fuck it, we'll just eat, just eat french fries, you stupid little kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, but you should yeah. have slapped yeah. them, taken them home, and made them eat whatever the fuck kids. I don't even know what dinosaur, fucking chicken nuggets. I don't know what the fuck kids eat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's pretty much it, right? That and pizza. <laughs> Uh, macaroni yeah. and cheese that nug life dude yeah. those that, tendies yeah. those dino nugs yeah, yeah those yeah. tendies and uh and pizza and mac and cheese i want a dino <laughs> nug that's the size of my eat. computer though that's how big of a dino I oh need, you can get one and oh. i need like 60 of them yeah yeah, yeah that, like that'd like those be, like, giant frozen in yeah. the center <laughs> no <matter how> long. <laughs> yeah it's true yeah, and like when the, your kids go to other people's houses they'll ask for the dino nuggets because they have yeah. every parent has them in the freezer mm -hmm. yeah oh. i miss those days yeah but yeah i mean it's weird we're 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 definitely overstimulated but we're also distracted so we have this weird combination where there's just all these flares all these things gathering our attention and they're designed that way right like everything on social media mm -hmm. is designed to like get you distracted and continue scrolling but at the same time we're not we need a little bit more like boredom and we don't have that we can yeah. just like go through netflix you never have to like self-reflect and and to your point mental health is is it's a lifestyle like it's mm. not you don't have to wait till these things build up to be trauma to do this if you're maintaining it and these can sort of supplement that help you get a little bit more uh introspective and kind of have that zoom out of like holy shit like this isn't important or i've been super yeah. distracted by this mm. or what have you yeah i think our baseline as humans is to kind of be negligent and mm. kind of ignore what the issues are and what's going on and i think for the most part like as long as and this was the biggest takeaway from from my trip was like the the things to do on a daily basis that like keep you in that good positive mental state mm. and it was like very specifically catered towards me and what i could specifically do and i'm sure talking to the other people that went on the trip were the same way but it was just like man i i can't believe how like cut and dry and it was like maybe because i'm a dumb grunt marine like i need the barney style version of this stuff but it dude it listed out it was like do these things and it will keep you in the positive state that you need to be in forever yeah it was like here's your playbook dude yeah go yeah. to work it was great <laughs> mine is you know look we we host uh this podcast every single day and then another one every single day so i'm, I'm reading the news all the time and it just starts to eat away with you. I mean, even, but every day and it's something new every day and it's exactly what you were talking about. And like just going through it today with like the, the first three stories that I read coming in here today, mm. the Tom Cruise fakes that scared the shit out of me. Right. I, I mean, absolutely scared the shit out of me. Next one, California law would ban boys and girls sections at retailers. So yeah. We're just going to lump them all together and, and let all the kids a, change it's together. It's a thousand dollar fine to have the toys separated by gender as well. Now yeah. while they're trying to pass this bill. Yeah. Uh, Kentucky bill would make it a crime to taunt and insult cops. 
I'm okay with that one. No, fuck that. <laughs> some you want to be able to tonic a cop? Yes. Some of the best <laughs> clips I see on fucking Instagram lately are dudes getting, like, as get, they're getting arrested, they're just roasting the fuck out of the cop. I want both of those things. <laughs> I want that guy to be arrested because he committed a crime. I also want to hear him roasting that cop because it's funny. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It's not about your feelings, Mr. Officer. Uh, the other one, the, the, the groomed by the governor thing with this girl and, and oh, Cuomo, yeah. right? I, not that Cuomo isn't a fucking dirtbag and a creepy guy, but I actually watched the interview. Um, and I listened to this girl's story and it was just like, he was asking her things about, you know, her life and her, you know, sexual history and mm. things like that. But it was in related to, I guess she was raped uh, when she was younger or something like that mm. or whatever. But if, if it's your boss and you're asking about it, he didn't say, I want to fuck you or anything else or whatever. So... How do you separate that from everything else that's going on and blah, blah, blah. And it's, uh, I don't know. I feel like if you're a, if you're a, an, especially like a, a boomer or a late, oh yeah, a boomer, or a Gen X man right now, mm -hmm. like an older 45 plus dude, and you're in a position of authority over a female in the workplace at all. And you might feel some compulsion because you had daughters or whatever, or you currently do to be a father figure to this person. Don't even fucking think about it. Now, right? Don't even fucking think about doing that shit. Because it's going to be... I mean, it's not because of her and it's not because you shouldn't do it. It's because society is conditioning these young people to feel a certain way about that behavior, to feel like it's predatory. Mm -hmm. Because they feel like masculinity is predatory, right? Yeah. And that it's obviously that's nonsense, but that's how they feel. And there's no good to come to that. <laughs> you, you will find yourself in a lawsuit if you do that. I Absolutely. But, but all these little things add up throughout the day and you're like, shit, man, I wish there was a release with, with what you guys are talking about. And I think maybe five to 10 years ago, it seemed taboo and ridiculous. And yeah, man, I'm going to go down there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a dinosaur beak and uh, I'm going to start <laughs> looking for, for eggs that don't exist and things like that. And then somebody's going to put an Iron Man thing in my, my chest and I'm going to be a better <laughs> human, right? But... It's, you know, a four day thing and you're going through all, all these uh, stages of, of this process. Um, just moving to Austin, Texas here, when we got here, I started seeing all these commercials for ketamine treatment. So you go into a therapist and then they give you injections and you sit there and you talk to a therapist with ketamine. I think little by little, and, and you guys will be able to expand on this, I think it's becoming more and more acceptable to where it's not like the weird fucking thing where a bunch of hippies are going down to the jungle just to get fucked up on drugs. It's, it's definitely starting to change, and that's good. Like I said, more tools. Ketamine's super effective for certain people with depression. It has almost immediate effects. Um, you have to kind of keep doing it, but uh, MDMA, uh, what people know as ecstasy, uh, just passed the third stage FDA trial, so mm -hmm. within a couple of years that will be able to be prescribed. And with MDMA that has like 70 to 80 percent success rate uh in terms of like helping people with ptsd through again magnifying talk therapy so that's amazing and these hallucinogens they're going to offer another tool all working in different capacities all can be helpful and what we've seen in the the psychedelic space uh it really has gained momentum there's still a lot of headwinds but you're getting places like respected places like Johns Hopkins that has a psychedelic uh, actual arm now. Mm -hmm. NYU is doing the same sort of thing. Yep. All these major universities, because the more you dive into it and you look at the actual scientific evidence, you're just like, holy shit, there's a lot here. Like, mm. I didn't even, I had no idea that there's this whole trove of, of evidence. And this dates back to the 50s. And that's the problem with, like, you know, certain regulations and how powerful it is to just kind of, convince people that this is something different uh where they're doing effective studies of psilocybin in the 1950s and then all of a sudden you weren't even allowed to talk about it yeah because uh, you know I, I've, I've gone to therapy once or twice to do it um i don't i didn't find it that effective to be honest with you which um, uh, where i'm just talking about things, oh, yeah. right um where i just I can't sit there with one person that's a stranger that I don't know, completely sober, and talk about my life and try to have a genuine, honest conversation or get a reaction out of it. Like, I just can't do it, me personally. This is why this sounds like a better way to me. And my, uh, my breaking point was you know, I was treatment resistive or just stuck, stuck in the depression. Nothing was working. None of, the medication, none of the medications were working. And I opened a letter from the VA, from the doctor, and it was his recommendation that I be sent downtown for 18 sessions of electroconvulsive therapy. And like, wow. I'm like, that's next? 
Like that, that's really like that's that's next. You want to shock my brain? That's like, to, awful. To fix this. And that's where they put the paddles. Yeah, like yeah, on yeah, your yeah, temples. Yeah. And I'm like, why is that okay? But it's not okay for me to go drink this little liquid. You know, that's been yeah. around for hundreds, if not thousands yeah. of years. And if that doesn't like work, we're giving myself. you a lobotomy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, Brain like, it's, we're just, we're, our, our mental health processes are so broken within this country. We're just too reliant on pharmacology. And then like, oh, that doesn't work. We'll shock them. Yeah. You know, fix yeah. it. Like, there's yeah. a better way. And that's what we're here to do is to show that there's not only a better way to heal, but a better way to live. Like, once you learn these lessons, you can move forward from that. And that could be the rest of your life and helping others to find that way as well. I think Dan had a little ayahuasca here. Uh, he's, he's going to the bathroom a lot. You all right, Dan? Anthony? Yeah, we're gonna uh, piss and give blood tomorrow. Oh, you gotta piss and give blood tomorrow. Yep. Okay. For what? Uh, for uh, food allergies. Really? Okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, not for anything specific. It's just a normal checkup. But my last sample was bullshit. So, because I was, I got fucking hammered the day before. <laughs> Solid. <laughs> uh, I forgot that I had the appointment. I just got shit faced. Uh, so I have one in the morning. I got you. Got you. Got you. Gonna do it right this time. Because I was like, dude, did you try to ask it before coming on the show? You look like you're shitting yourself. But no, uh, I'm, I'm just peeing. pissing your brains out. A lot of so water. your urine was like forty proof. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that was um, that happened to me once. It was too, by clear, the way. but I was still. I, if your urine is clear and you're still drunk, you're fucked, yes. right? I mean, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. There's no yes. point in even peeing in a bottle at that point. It's going to melt the bottom out. I uh, I did that uh, recently, and mm-hmm. the, the, he was like, "Dude, let's just reschedule." Yeah. <laughs> How hard did you go last night? And I was like, "Well, was... yeah." I don't even know why I let him take the blood. To be honest, yeah, like, this is mostly fucking gravy and vodka. So yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Um, back to your MDMA thing that you were talking about. There is some places here in Austin. You have to know who they are. Where you can go into the back room, and they're already doing that stuff. Yeah, one of them is my house. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> is that one of your eventual goals for for your organization is to bring it to the United States? Because I'm sure we have a you know a ton of listeners at home saying, "All right, man, I can't afford to travel down to Peru, uh, take eight days off away from my my children or my wife or my job or whatever it is." It would be a lot more effective because I think a lot of people want to do things like this. Right. If it was here in the U.S. Is this one of your eventual goals is to expand this here so that way it's like, all right, great. Let's set one right up outside of Fort Bragg or wherever it is. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we want to keep open options. And, you know, for, for a lot of people won't even want to do it in the, the traditional setting. And if they want right. to go to a clinic where they get psilocybin in 10 years, then they should have the right to do that, you know. And the same thing with like MDMA and, and ayahuasca or all these sort of stuff. If we can increase access, but but maintain quality and maintain mm-hmm. certain standards and respect for how it's going and, and making sure we know where it's coming from, because obviously there's going to be um, issues with harvesting, you know, plants from the Amazon and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. As long as we can maintain quality and, and do that, then for sure. But we also want to maintain what we have in Peru, what we have in these other countries, because there's a lot of beauty to that. There's a lot of this cultural history and, and it's, you know, it's, it's their it's their practices, it's their medicine. And so we want to maintain that sort of respect. Like if you do want to come here, we can show you some sort of quality way to do it. And you're going to get a lot out of it. In Texas? Not right now, but down the line. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. But if you also want to do it like at the heart of it and go back and, and have this sort of very authentic, that should be, you know, you should be able to do that too. Of course, of course, yeah. Um, and so what we're seeing too, and that's starting to open up is like you see what just passed in Oregon, it was a measure 109. And so that passed, uh, there's actually a bill that we're sponsoring in California too, that will allow either clinical use of psilocybin, so mushrooms mm-hmm. or ceremonial use. And so that's <clears throat> two to three years away from people actually doing that, even though it did pass, they have to implement it, come up with the regulations and all that kind of stuff. But that will be a thing where people can go in Oregon and go to you know either a ceremony or their their physician and they'll be trained and and they're getting you know the the, the intelligence from people who have been doing this for a while uh and take psilocybin and use it in a therapeutic fashion and that's in my opinion awesome yeah because uh, you know I, I know they're getting ready to build some of these retreats so to speak right where you can go for the weekend some type of hotel experience and things like that. I, ironically, Mike Tyson's doing one for cannabis. There aren't a whole lot of places in the U.S. that I would want to do that. Maybe somewhere in Idaho, Wyoming, or Montana, to be honest. I mean, everybody's a little different, right? But you got to be off the beaten path yeah. a little bit. Yeah. you got to be away from other. You can. I don't want to be in Times Square. No, to what Logan was saying before, I mean, you're, the, the American mind, our, our corporatist consumer mind thinks, why not just build a giant facility? But to his point from earlier, you... 
I don't, I don't know how to explain this either. Uh, it's, I'm sure there's, it, it, maybe I just made it up, but it, you can feel the pressure of people around you, right? You can feel people's energy around you. That's a real fucking thing. I mean, it's a real thing in physics. I don't want to hear anything from all, any of you cunts. I know way more about physics than you guys do. <laughs> uh, it, is a, it is a real thing, positive and negative attraction of ions, all the way up to matter and, and mass and how gravity affects the way we feel with each other. It's just a matter of our ability to be sensitive enough to feel it, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like when you're on these drugs, you can feel, every, all, you can feel everything around you. Yeah. And uh, you don't want to be in some fucking, uh, you don't want to be at that, whatever those recovery treatment places in Phoenix are. You don't want to be in some big glass building. Even if they made it look like the Amazon inside, you would know it's not. Right. You know what I mean? I don't think you can replicate that, in my opinion. Yeah, you don't want the stimulation to be a negative experience in its, of right. itself. And because basically, like, with a lot of stuff, it's, it's going to amplify whatever mm. environment you're already in. Yeah. And if that environment's like homeless people, um, angry people, yeah. Uh, yeah. dirty things, like, that's how you're going to feel. Yeah. And that, I think there's probably something about that dual leg journey down to Peru also that resets your brain and prepares you a little bit for what's coming yeah. you know what i mean you know you're in a different spot than where you were before before you even start taking the drug you and i'm sure you can just check out a life no cell phones and yeah, yeah exactly. electronics there's and, there's yeah. a lot of benefit like you're getting away from we we have people get off technology and all that but it's also i mean like your brain does like specific chapters and so if you can signal to your brain on an outside like hey this is a new phase and i'm doing this then that's beneficial mm. but there's also an inherent <laughs> sort of connection with all of these to nature like, and that's why I think also veterans really like it because they're already pretty much connected to nature. They mm. love going in the woods. They love mm. being outdoors. And so, like, especially like psilocybin, ayahuasca, you just have such an appreciation. You feel so interconnected with nature. And so, yeah, be in like Idaho, mm. be by beautiful scenery. Because if you just immediately go from your apartment to Times Square, you're just gonna yeah. be like overwhelmed. Yeah, yeah. Bill, yeah. Bill Hicks used to tell a story about that. He like fucking dumb people are taking mushrooms and going to a fucking amusement park and riding a goddamn roller coaster. Like, of course you freaked out, you idiot. Go to nature. <laughs> yeah. what the fuck are you doing? Go stand under a tree and look up for free. And that's where the supposed like bad trips come from. The yeah. the, the common thing is set and setting, right? And so yeah, if you're yeah. if you're going to like a Metallica concert yeah. on ayahuasca. That's probably not the best no. thing. Mushrooms, though, are pretty fun. <laughs> ben, I've done one of those. Yeah. Uh, Metallica? Yeah. That's intense. Any man. concert is good in mushrooms, I promise you that. Metallica, level. though, that's, that's a little intense. Good. I they're, could get down for they, some of that action. <laughs> I'm good for that. Metallica is pretty good at concerts, surprisingly, considering how cookie cut of a band Their it is. Their second album was literally no, like Ride the Lightning. They're great. Uh, uh, I did Ride a, the Lightning is good. I did a movie food. with them, and they actually played the after party. Yeah, uh, at the movie, it was fucking crazy. It's Sundance. I mean, um, Lars is Lars is not the best drummer, but no, he was the biggest piece of shit during that Napster deal. Yeah, uh, I, I just watched that uh, San Francisco yeah, Philharmonic. It's thing. great. Fucking not awesome. a lot. Of, not a lot of bands could have pulled that off. They're really good. But anyways, yeah, any band, I think, is good on those. On mushrooms. Yeah, like I just wouldn't want to. But, maybe not like Insane Clown Pals or something. Like that. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you sure. But, could, yeah. And it's also like, and that again is the intention. Like, know what you're doing. Mm. So, like, if you're just going there to like bond with friends, like you're in Joshua Tree and you're just mm. like, I'm just going to hang out here and connect with nature. Yeah. Or yeah. if you're just like, hey, I want to have fun at this concert, know what you're going to do. And that's, yeah. you should have the right to do that. Like, who's I've to never, say? I've never had, I've done acid well over 700 times. I've done mushrooms, I don't even know how many times, six, 700 probably at this point. I've never had a single bad trip ever because of that yeah like i the first time was a little weird i was like oh shit fuck's happening here right but a, a, after that as soon as it clicked in my head like the biggest things that clicked in my head were uh this is not real and this doesn't last forever and then i took those two lessons and i applied it to my entire goddamn life you know what i mean mm -hmm. from a from a very young age because i was struggling with some things back then uh, uh spectrum disorder and bullshit so from a very young age i applied that and then immediately was able to see from other people's perspectives all the time because it's not about you, right? This life is not about you. you. You're traveling through it, sure, but it's not about you. It's about everything else. I mean, how could it be about you? Why would it be about you? That doesn't make any fucking sense. No, it doesn't make any when sense. Our everything we do, every fucking movement conscious life makes is to pull ping people together. Somehow we've come to the conclusion that it's all about us. That is the dumbest shit I've ever heard in my life. I think that's one of the big, you know, that's the other part that we're seeing with like mental health and what we're trying to address is it's not, we, we tend to look at it very black and white, like, Oh, you had this bad experience. or you have PTSD and not looking at like, what are you eating? What's your diet? What's your, are you having a miserable job? Like, did yeah. you get head trauma? We don't consider it. Or they're changing, but the VA has been pretty bad about that. Um, but if you do have all those, those, those considerations, those connectivities, 
what veterans come from this first time thinking about the unit, the, the brotherhood, the, the sisterhood, the, the connection, the, the other people beyond them, and then they go into like corporate America where mm. it's like getting out for yourself and yeah. it's like this contrast of like, this yeah, is I mean, all about it's, me now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting you say that because in any military unit, particularly, you know, people that do shooting for a living like we did, some guy that's out for himself is the shit bag of the unit. Everybody fucking hates that person. Nobody likes them. But you get into the corporate world and the managers who, who would be, you know, uh, uh, colonels and generals, I guess, in, in this metaphor, like that guy. You know what I mean? That's, that's, that's a very weird fucking transition to go from one being an alpha in a unit where you're fucking, sh- fucking shit up for a living, but where people... It's not about, uh, I, I guess it's about honor, I guess, but really it's about just the expectation that everybody's there to do a job and that it only works if we're all doing it in the same direction, right? And then you get into this corporate world and it's just like a free-for-all. Not only is it a free-for-all, yeah. it's not just about like, you could say, you could, you could bring up Nash equilibrium theory and how people working together but towards a lesser goal than the top goal would be beneficial in some way or whatever the fuck are any of these economic principles, but... It's about people fucking stepping on each other to get places. Yeah. Like, fuck you. Yeah. Like, th- was the 20 extra thousand dollars a year you made worth this guy's fucking career? You know what I mean? Really? Yeah. Is that yeah. where you are in life? You're a piece of shit if that's the case. Yeah, I think my participation in, in the psychedelics could, like, kind of be boiled down to, like, two things. One, stimulation and purpose. Like, I, I don't know if I can necessarily recall, like, when it was, but, like, you know, another answer to your question earlier like what was wrong with it or what's wrong you know yeah it's like you just feel cold sometimes like sometimes mm-hmm. i think a lot of service guys like they just feel fucking empty yeah. like nothing gives them excitement anymore like they used to do this rad epic job they were rocking and rolling with a gun every single day of their lives they were trying to skirt explosions and like they're coordinating air attacks like that's fucking rad and then you come into this existence to where all of that just goes away and you're like man i can't fucking feel anything anymore yeah, and man, not only i that, need something yeah you get out and then you 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 think you'll have this great job right yeah um, and then you get into the corporate world and there's just a bunch of fucking dicks that are ahead of you who had none of the life experience that you had will never see any of the cool shit that you guys did and then they're the ones that are telling you what to fucking do every day yeah. saying hey man is that fucking TPS report ready? And you're yeah. like, man, fuck you. And you're yeah. like, yeah, oh, is this my purpose now? Like, yeah. is this yeah. what, the, what yeah. the fuck I'm supposed to be doing? Is this, this corporate douchebag yeah, telling me what to do? I bet, I bet GY guys deal with that more than... I, World War II, I think, was just like the stress, man. I mean, they were fucking... That, that whole scene in goddamn uh, in Bastogne and then uh, just, just lying in the fucking ditch with trees exploding around you for days, a month. Like, fuck, every single day it's 12 goddamn degrees outside. That prolonged exposure to stress, even if there was no danger necessarily, it was just that amount of stress over that period of time will give anybody PTSD, right? Yeah. But yeah. For, for us, I think there is part of it where we grew up in this video game culture where you and I literally went and played video games in real life for a while. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? We had all the cool shit. We had fucking all the capabilities to do whatever the fuck we want. And if there's, to be honest, not to sound like an asshole, but if there's a godlike quality to it. You feel like very powerful walking around with a gun and calling in airstrikes. Obviously. And why wouldn't you feel that way? You know what I mean? Yeah. Then you get back here and what is the purpose exactly? I mean, you can't, one of the things you have to go through is to, determined that that wasn't my purpose then that's just what i was doing you know what i mean like my purpose right. overall was the, the reason most people join the military is to help other people right that was my purpose it wasn't to do all this fucking shit so when you're realigning yourself post-service you have to go down to the lowest possible level what was my actual purpose like what was what was what what put me there in the first place not politicians or circumstance, what decisions did I make to put myself there? Because that'll tell you why you did it, right? Mm-hmm. And then when you get out, you apply that same standard. Help people. Find a reason to help people if that's what you wanted to do. Yeah. I, it's funny, man. My grandfather was in World War II. And, uh, and I asked him, I was like, you know, with the stress and everything you were going through of, of thinking it was going to be over at any mm-hmm. second with all this crazy shit that was going on. Yeah. He said, he was like, when he got out, he had this super like rad corporate job. He was like mm-hmm. vice president, he ended up becoming like vice president of Allstate. And he goes, that stress though, helped me in the corporate world where mm-hmm. I was able to stop all these motherfuckers. Yeah. You know? It I'm should, sure. it should. And it's, you know, it's a problem right now that we're not allowing it to, to do that. But I think it's because we're distracted. Like you were saying earlier, there's just all this distraction right now. These lessons are there to be learned. 
they're available to be learned. Uh, I don't believe people that, that there's this old uh, quote that says uh, a smart man learns from his own mistakes. A wise man learns from the mistakes of others. I guess there's some application to that, but that is bankrupt to me. You have to fucking go through the shit to learn that lesson. That's just how it is in life. Yeah. I think that my favorite thing about having this conversation is like, it just promotes self-reliance. Yeah. Like yeah. figure your shit out, man. And like at the end of the day, nobody's going to put the care effort or love that you can into yourself. Yeah, exactly. So like, why not be your, your, your greatest ally as yeah, you go through you have this to. thing? And it's, you know, part of looking after yourself is swallowing your fucking pride and asking for help when you need it. Yeah. And it's it, with self reliance, it's the same thing where it's like, you're the only one that knows you need help. Yeah. Right? yeah. There might be others like, around you but who you, see certain things. But you've been in that headspace before. I know you have because I have because we did the same fucking job. You've been in that headspace where you feel like nobody else is working as hard as you are yep. and how all the bad things are happening to you and these people don't even care. They don't even fucking know what's happening to you. Why would they care about some shit they don't know about? But that's yeah. a, it, you're catastrophizing your, your emotional reasoning at that point. That's the fucking shit we're trying to wipe the fuck out with this therapy, right? Yeah. Um, look, man, this is an unbelievably fascinating show. Uh, this is the point in the, in the show where we get to the drinking bro of the week. I'm going to give it to you. Why, why did you start this? Why did you start this company? Uh, it was just my own journey. Uh, I had a lot of struggles when I got out, and I just saw that there was severely limited um, understanding or options, and I was just hitting the wall and hitting the wall, and I just knew that I would end up in a very bad spot if I didn't change it. For whatever reason, uh, ayahuasca came across my radar. I'm like, I must be fucking crazy, but I'm going to do this. And just going through it, it was like, this is not what I thought it was. And there's a lot of power here. And just seeing my, what permanently changed myself and everybody else around me, it was like, hey, the, our community needs more options. Our community at least needs to know about this. Yeah. And so, again, like what Dan was saying, like, we, we want to help others. We, are, we have that energy to serve others. And so it was just like this was the next best thing. And I started it, started reaching out to people. And they're like, yeah, let's, let's do it. And it just really took a life of its own. Uh, and, and for the Drinking Bro of the Week, it's, it's usually somebody who's inspired you or helped you become the person you are today. But who helped you say, hey, man, there is an alternative path that I, I think would help what you're going through as far as like the ayahuasca and stuff like that. Was there, was there one person that said, Hey man, I did this and it works and it's amazing. No. I mean like for me, fortunately I had the intuition and I heard like podcasts like on Rogan and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. he's been a good like ambassador of it, but I think it's really just having, I've, I've been fortunate to have a loving family that no matter what crazy stuff I do, I always have that safety net. And so I felt safe to go and even though I didn't really know anybody, I knew I was taking a big leap of faith in a lot of ways and just leaving my job and going here. But I knew I always had that ability to do it because of my, my family. And so those are the people that, you know, I'm, I'm super grateful to always have. Yeah, because I've got to imagine that's a hard conversation to have with your parents. What are you going to do with your life? You know what? I'm going to start this ayahuasca journey down in <laughs> Peru. Yeah. What? Yeah, I'm going to do drugs with, uh, with a bunch of people all the time and try to find myself. I left that fat toy till after I got back. <laughs> <laughs> what did you tell me? You were just going to go down and look at pinto beans? I was just like, hey, I'm struggling here in Tampa. I got I to gotta reset the system. I don't know what's going on. I need to figure this stuff out. And they're, they're worried, obviously. But I was like, hey, I'm going to travel a little bit, get out of my bubble, maybe reflect, uh, figure out what I could do. Uh, over there, get out of whatever the, you know, what, what you're saying. I was just getting buried and buried under all that kind of shit. Yeah. And uh, they're just like, okay, we trust you. I mean, you've, you've done some left turns before and it's worked out in favor, in your favor. So uh, fortunately, you know, I have that trust, even if it seems like a completely asinine uh, thing. And so I was just going there and then kind of threw in the, the ayahuasca thing after it didn't drive me crazy and turned me <laughs> yeah, into yeah, a glass yeah. of orange juice. <laughs> yeah. I, look, to be fair, it also could have been Tampa. Um, I lived there for a year, <laughs> and that, that could really fuck a person up from the inside. Uh, tell everybody out there where they can find you and uh, learn more about your organization uh, and how to actually go and do these things with you. Yeah, absolutely. So it's Heroic Hearts Project, uh, the website heroicheartsproject.org. We're a nonprofit, 501c3. Uh, so you can go on the website. There's a veteran application. We also have ambassadors for people who just want to volunteer or lend their voice. Um, and you know, uh, we're, we're, the machine runs through donations. So if, if people can help us out, it just, the money goes directly to getting veterans like Logan and Zach to this therapy with the full support and continue to educate and spread the word. Okay. And then a uh, last question for you, Logan, did you document the journey? Like, did you document while you were tripping and all that stuff? Like, do you have a video of it? Um, 
I kept a journal through the whole thing as most of us did, but um, there was a, a group down there that filmed the whole thing. Um, and Jesse will probably be able to tell a little bit more about where that where that's at. Uh, yeah, would you recommend that? Documentary. What's that? Would you recommend filming it, or mm-hmm. is that is it such a personal experience? It's mostly like German pornography at that point, right? Because it's just <laughs> shit everywhere. Yeah, well, well, yeah, it's a lot of scat porn, obviously. <laughs> but uh, uh, would you recommend that at all? Uh, I recommend journaling and you can take photos, but no, I mean like ideally we wouldn't, it's just a question. There's so much stigma and taboo to get around that we do mm-hmm. need to document it. And it doesn't, fortunately it doesn't take too much away from it. It's ideal if somebody can go there and they're not like self-conscious about cameras and all that kind of shit. But, um, you know, we need to get the testimonies out. You know, we need to have other veterans know that it's okay to ask for help and seek alternatives that people might think are crazy. Yeah, because, uh, you know, the Chelsea Handler thing, I, I personally hate Chelsea Handler. Um, <laughs> but seeing it and seeing what she went through in the whole process, it eased my mind a little bit of like, all right, well, th- it's not as crazy as you hear, you know? I mean, that, the, just that fact in itself betrays how we think about things in society. We're so risk averse yeah. that we won't even ask for fucking yeah. help. Yeah. yeah. How fucking stupid is that? Like, I mean, there's, there's some level of being risk averse that makes sense. If you see a colorful snake, probably walk in the other direction. That's a good idea, right? Mm-hmm. But if, you're, if there are things you need to do to move your life forward and you won't because you're afraid of asking even, not of the consequences, just of asking the goddamn question, we fucked, we've, we have failed ourselves as a community. All of us. Now we're failing our children doubly. They, they, we're, if, if you read that book, The Coddling of the American Mind, you, they, these guys are both liberals, by the way. They lay out how... Uh, we are now teaching people to feel those things like catastrophizing and emotional reasoning instead of untraining people with PTSD. So we're giving these children PTSD yeah. now and then sending them out into the world like, good luck. Yeah, yeah, good yeah, luck, yeah, guy. Yeah. You know what happens? Safe they're spaces. all fucking, they're all mad and offended about everything. Oh, yeah, dude. Yeah. About everything. Like they have no ability to hear something that they disagree with and that be okay. Yeah. Yeah. And pretty soon it'll all be pulled down. Yeah, hopefully this is in an archive underground one day. And pull this up in forty years and be like, "Holy shit, that no. wasn't even that bad of a conversation." And they no. pull this fucking thing. No. Uh, we appreciate being here, gentlemen. Mm. Um, great organization, and uh, I, I truly believe it would help a lot of people. Uh, so please go and check them out. Uh, for Danthony, Danthony Holloway, I'm Ross Patterson. We are the Drinking Bros. Good night, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>